let's get the thing started. Welcome oh, yeah. to the DDHD podcast. Welcome. Are we recording? We are. One, We're two, good. Three. Cameras are on. Grand, Cameras grand, ain't going to turn off this time. All right. All right. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Um, we have a very, very special guest today. A Mr. Legend. Defy the Odds himself. Yes. Man. Yes. Oh, yeah. Good friend of mine. <laughs> we have uh, Dwayne D.O. Gibson. Let's give it, it up for Dwayne, yeah. man. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. For sure. Um, I am one of your co hosts, Marwan Manamna, and we got. Juice Rochester, Rochester Juice. All right. I mean, there's so many things that we can name for D.O. You are an artist, musician, author motivational speaker mr yeah. international guinness world book of record breaker like right. how much what what else am i missing here two-time guinness champ two-time yeah, guinness that. champ you my yeah, bad no, gotta, don't forget gotta, the second one my bad time my right bad now. don't miss that one that for sure <laughs> anything else <laughs> No, that's it. That's, that's it. I mean, no, it seems like it, no, nope. he's not yeah, done yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One yeah. Half I'm one of uncle, Art of Fresh, Art of Fresh. Yo, hey. one of the greatest groups out of Toronto, man. Like the vibes on that. I was a privilege to be on Out of This World, the yeah. remix. You know what I mean? Like very big tune, and still bumping it today. Yep. Hey. Make sure you check that out. True. Um, yeah, true. Founder yo. of Northern Power Summit. That's as right. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know how you find Grant Master Flash. Hey. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, you've done so much Stay driven. in your life. Stay driven, yeah. Stay driven. The book. The book itself. On this grind. Yes. Yeah. Who I listened to on the uh, on Spotify, actually. I like yep. the audio. It was a great book, man. Thank, Thank you. you. I think any anybody coming up who wants to learn about the business of music, you know what I'm saying? Not not the flair or the, you know, the superficial part of it, mm -hmm. I guess you would say. Um, learn the business. Mm -hmm. How to mm -hmm. actually make some money and how to actually stay yeah. in the business for a long time. You yeah. want to get at that this guy with this. One. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Get at this guy for that. You know what I'm saying? Excuse Thank me. you. That's mm -hmm. right. Because you are like a, I mean, you're the definition of a successful independent artist. You mm -hmm. know, you've been doing it for so long with no major label backing you, self-funding yourself, traveling the world, chasing your dreams, doing whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. And is that why you wanted to make this book and write this book to share that knowledge to other independent artists or entrepreneurs? 100%. Because I think success is really what you define on your own terms. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize it, I'd say about 12 years ago, maybe 13, 14 years ago now I'm thinking. But I remember like I'd go out to places and people would say congratulations. And I didn't know what they were saying congrats for, you know what I mean? I was like, w and maybe it was getting a grant or maybe it's I was touring or I was having my first kid. But uh, I wrote a song called Can't Tell Me I Ain't Made It. Mm, okay. Because I said, everywhere I go, they saying congratulations. You can't tell me that I ain't made it. I'm doing shows out in Vegas. And uh, to me, that's when it really sunk in that success isn't really about getting that million dollar record deal, which you know, has changed over the years anyways, right? It's not about a record deal, but it's really about what you define as success. And I want to share that with artists because I find a lot of upcoming artists or emerging artists, they don't really have concrete goals. They know what they, they know kind of that they want to do music or they want to do something, yeah. but they don't know where that's going to lead to or how to monetize their dreams or how to actually perform in another country. So I wanted to share some of those techniques that mm -hmm. I was able to use and not just myself, but I've seen so many of the artists do the same thing. So it's like, instead of people just always asking me the same questions, I just put it down in a book. So if you want to learn, just read the book and then ask me some questions. <laughs> Facts. Cause I'm sure you get asked that a lot, man. Like I remember even when just trying to get back into the music business from me taking my hi hiatus and shit, DL's one of the first people I linked, yo, to mm. say, bro, what are you dealing with? Like, you know, let's connect on some. And you brought me out to Amsterdam. Right. And yeah. you know what I'm saying? We we were able to connect. And to this day, we're, you know what I mean? We're still traveling and making moves right now, man. Because yeah. I, I know when it comes to, you know, being an independent artist, it's one of the hardest things to do. And if, psh, listen, man, a, a lot have tried and a lot have failed <laughs> at this thing, you know? So... If there is some sort of formula, and everybody's formula is different, but if there was some sort of formula, I would say the DL route's a really good one to take if, mm -hmm. if you're that type of artist, you know what I mean? Um, because it's meant for the long run, not, mm -hmm. not a short run, you know what I mean? And I think that's important. 
Well, I think that to try and to fail are the two things I hate. Succeed in this rap game, the two things that's great. great. <laughs> <laughs> Knew I'd stick up. that in there. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, but it's so true. Is you know, I remember asking Maestro when I first really connected with him, like twenty years ago, and I asked him, "Did you ever feel bitter?" at some point mm -hmm. and that was 20 years ago you know what i mean he's carved out another whole career these last 20 years but i just remember thinking about artists getting to a point where they were throwing in the towel or they felt bitter and there was so much of that like i was listening to your uh, interview with marlon mm -hmm. and just thinking about like how much toronto's changed we didn't have as much confidence in ourselves back then yep. yeah but like being in the canadian music business in the late 90s and early 2000s it's not like there was a lot of roads open. There wasn't a lot of success stories. No, there was not. So you can understand why a lot of artists would try and fail, fail. And, and just give up. But um, it's it's encouraging to me to see some of those artists either reinvent themselves or still be out here, whether what capacity they're in. Like when you see uh, Bishop coming out with his clothing line, the end, you know, and, and stuff like that. Like it's it's great to see Big uh, up Bishop, for yeah, sure. Big up Bishop. Mm -hmm. Like it's great to see artists still doing their thing. Mm -hmm. You know, your dream's gonna change, but but it's still hip hop. Tell us a little bit about how you started, man, because you've been in the yeah. industry now for how many years? Thirty years? No, no, yeah, not yeah. yet. Really? Well, I, I don't know. You know, like it's, yeah. it's kind of like... 20 years? I started writing rhymes 30 years ago, though. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, but, it was uh, already a business. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody was writing his verses on crayon. He's like, yeah, how yeah. can I, I make I doing this? It. I think like What's for me... What's the return on this? I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie okay. and Sarnia, Ontario. Okay. So Small towns? Small towns, but I think really for Sarnia is where I really started being an MC because it's right across from the border. Like, it's a border town. Like, you yeah. go downtown and you can see Michigan, like, right there. Oh, mm -hmm. shit. You just take the bridge right over. So, it's like, I would go over there to get music, getting CDs and tapes. And I always remember coming to Toronto and being frustrated by import fees at HMV. <laughs> like, it was so expensive. Or Detroit is 45 minutes away. Yeah. So, I was listening to JLB, the radio station there, and they were playing hip-hop in the day and at night, whereas... And it's commercial. Now, I know you get BLK back in the day. Yep. But, you know, this is Detroit. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and having that kind of influence of knowing that Motown was there. Yeah. From all those great Motown artists, too many to name, was a, a thing. Or I remember going to the hip hop shop. Um, this is before really the internet was really there or even MapQuest. Like, Yo, I remember my parents driving Quest, me down man. to this the shop. This is a time machine <laughs> right now, man. And it makes me think about how people today, like the value of music, how much it's gone down. Mm -hmm. And yeah. just thinking about like, you know, like it was a big thing if you could get a Detroit station just to yeah. play some music. That's true. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't have, like you go to HMV, you get that tape, you'd be stuck with that tape or whenever they're playing hip hop or the half an hour a day that, that you would get of Rap City. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? For like sure. that's it or the hour of extended mix that you would get and yeah. that was it for your hip hop. Now it's everywhere and we love it and we get it, you know, but there are times when you're just grasping to find any type of music. For man. sure. It's big. And it's especially big. beats because there wasn't a lot of producers back in the day either, right? That too. I think that's one of the things that Canada really elevated with over time. Now we're known for our production, but I remember it just being so hard to find any producers mm -hmm. <laughs> who made beats. So uh, I can't relate to that one, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, no, that's right. You know, <laughs> I was blessed on that one. Yeah, but you know? like, I, I think like in the early 2000s, yeah. you'd see more and more of it. But, yeah. uh, but like I remember coming to Toronto and linking up with Agile because like Brass Monk, was doing Jeez. big things back in the, the day. And monk, yep. I remember getting Agile. a beat CD from Agile and just mm -hmm. being like, wow, these are dope beats. Mm -hmm. Like, here we go. Mm -hmm. But uh, but moving to Toronto, going to university, um, especially my last year of university, because the year before that, I lived in Barbados. I was oh, going really? to university there as an exchange student. Okay. And uh, was recording music on my old Toshiba laptop. It was like hey. black and white, but still doing it. But I came back to the city and... Um, I made a music video, self-financed, and it was able to get on much music, wow. which was a huge step, Big especially thing. as yep. something that wasn't financed by grants or anything. And to me, that was really my entry point into the professional rap game by getting on much music. Got it. And what made you want to be a rapper and a musician? Like, was it your parents, were they an influence or something like that? Or well, Detroit? I, 
Detroit. Yeah, really yeah. Detroit. But I mean, hip hop's an outlet, and mm-hmm. I think especially that I grew up in you know white areas, mm-hmm. that like yeah. hip hop was my method of accessing black culture and mm-hmm. gaining like knowing what's going on in the world, and Got it. and also, you know, hip hop is something like when I'm rapping in front of people at school and they're saying is you're good, you just feel good about yourself because I love playing basketball, but I'm no athlete. <laughs> you know, like mm. I didn't fit that stereotype or or just did you experience like any way. uh racism yeah up? definitely yeah yeah but i experienced racism but it wasn't racism mm, okay. as much as it was ignorance right. so what i mean by uh, that is i remember being called the n-word but they weren't saying it because they were racist they were just saying it because they had heard the word and just made it I, I tell kids this when did I talk a lot about of bullying. Checking back in the day, I'm sure. Like, well, it's just like, like nah, they nah, say nah. the word, but then they laugh. Mm, okay. So when somebody laughs after they say something like that, then and everybody else is laughing. It wasn't aggressive, like you. No. Oh, okay. It's just ignorance, that, like yeah. you said. Like, so it's they ignorance. Just don't know any better. But that's what like. growing up in the 80s and 90s were. People got yeah. picked on for a lot of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But especially when you're hearing that word, how do you deal with that? as a black kid you know and i've got my dad around my mom's white but like i'm glad that i was able to hang out with my dad and go out to mcdonald's and talk to him about it Uh or i was able to listen to hip-hop i remember like i was in grade 10 when tupac had the acronym of never ignorant getting goals accomplished right and like flipping it that way not flipping it in the way of we're owning this word so we can say it whenever because I didn't agree with that. Like, was even, your pops cool you listening to hip-hop? Yeah, my dad was always cool with yeah. it. I mean, my dad took me to see Fresh Prince as hey. my first concert. Damn. We were in the whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, hold up, hold up. Fresh Prince You concert. saw Will Smith Damn. perform when he was a rapper. Wow. Yeah, yeah. February 1990. Ooh. Wow. With Jazzy Jeff. He's the wow. DJ. I'm De La Soul opened. What? De La Soul opened for yeah. him. And it's crazy when I think about it because it was an all-Asian show. But there was no all ages people there. I was the only 12 year old kid. It was a club. You know what I mean? Wow. My dad would sit in the back and uh, I just wanted to go to the front. So I'd be in there like just with like 20 year olds and just sitting back being like, yo, this is dope. And then when we moved to Sault Ste. Marie, my dad took me to see Naughty by Nature. Damn. Now that was a trip because, you know, everybody knew Naughty by Nature because of OPP. Yeah. But when you realize yeah, Naughty by Nature, they were a gangster group in a lot of ways. You know what yeah, I mean? Sorry, yeah. man. Continue. Yeah. The, Trench was talking about like the size of his thing. You yeah. know what I mean? Out yep, there. Yep. And Shirtless probably performing. Yeah, a lot of cussing. My <laughs> yeah. dad's a minister, but my dad didn't sweat it. But it was just like my dad was still cool with that. Oh, your dad's a minister? Yeah, my dad's a minister. Oh, wow. A doctor of ministry too. Oh, wow. So he went to University of Chicago to get his doctorate. I went down to Chicago in the summer. See him down there, so... So, yeah, we go deep. And so was Will Smith, like, one of your biggest inspirations? Yeah, definitely. Yeah? It still is. It still is. But I, what I liked about Will Smith is parents just don't understand. Mm-hmm. Because it was funny, and he was telling a story. And that whole album, he's telling stories. And, like, even after that, like, I think I could beat Mike Tyson. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I loved his storytelling ability or girls in the world ain't nothing but trouble. So he was okay. a big influence, Will Smith. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and, yeah. and I mean, the fact that I don't swear on my records, he's known for not swearing and how he came up with a lot of like gangster rap culture was being popular, mm-hmm. but he was just like, nah, I'm going to do me. Mm-hmm. I'm going to work on this lane. And uh, I always respected that, you know, him and uh, LL Cool J. I mean, I mean, LL is another one, man. Yeah. Like he came out knocking that door in the '80s as well. Yeah, mama said, "Knock you out." He is <laughs> Def Jam too, you know. So when you when you uh, went to university and you got your first music video, you put it on Much Music. Like like that's a huge accolade. Was that the moment where you're like, "Yo, this is it. This is what I want to do." This is what I want to do, but it's also this is when I realized how complicated the business was. Ah, tell us about that. I looked at Canada and the international music game differently than i think a toronto artist did okay because i noticed well what i thought was a lot of toronto artists wanted to be taken over the city like i gotta be number one in toronto and i'm from mississauga you from scarborough and i gotta be the best rapper here or there and Mm -hmm. i never looked at it like that because when you grow up outside of toronto 
you look at it more on that national landscape because of much music. So when I came out with the music video, I wasn't thinking about distribution for my EP. I wasn't yeah. thinking about getting a publicist. I wasn't thinking about how to get on radio across the country. Mm -hmm. But doing that step made me think, doing. I got to do these things. Mm -hmm. And I got to learn, how do I tour? How do I do shows? So that's when I realized, okay, I got to really start learning the business. Got it. And that's when I started getting more into that business side of things and seeing that if I learn the business more, that's what's going to take me further. Because I knew, I noticed there wasn't very many managers or industry people that could help me. Mm -hmm. No worries. Just give it one second. You want to open that? It seems like there's a lot of opening and no, very yeah. good. Open. All right. Yeah, nice. <laughs> How much this ice are you guys going in? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. No, nah, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> tequila. Tequila. For real. All right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I wanted to ask you, were you like, yeah. were you a one man show back then? Yeah, I've always kind of been a one man show. Yeah. Well, in a way, but you uh, do a lot of things for yourself. But I, I love see. sharing the stage. Like uh, I had my man Poisonous as my hype man for a while. Okay. So he's a beatboxer, and I love bringing the elements of beatboxing. But I also knew when I was touring. It's great to have a beatboxer because they just get everybody's attention. Mm. And some of the shows we were doing on the road, I remember like we're in Golden, BC. And when we're in Golden, there's nobody at the show. It's one of those off nights, but you book something because you, you want to get a little bit of money and get your rooms taken of care course, of. Of course, of course. Yeah. And uh, we notice a group of people come in and as soon as they come in, they walk out the door. <laughs> and it's like an hour or two before the show. But they came in because they thought it was going to be the strip club night. Because out west, they tour okay. strip clubs. Okay. Like one night they're going to be in Golden. The next yeah. day, you know, Revelstoke. So me and Poisonous go out there. He starts beatboxing. Gets everybody's attention. Then I kick a little freestyle. Next thing you know, they come back in. Mm. And, you know, we get more and more people. So even if we had a crowd of 30 or 40 people, we still had a little bit of a crowd. Yo, so I, that's why a good hype man always comes in mm, handy. Shout out to the man. If you Poisonous. came up doing shows, you, you've had shows where there's less than that and you still rock the mic, yo. So to get 40, 50 is, is, trust me, and get 40, 50 fans, do that shit two, three times a week. You don't know what that turns into, man. Well, you got to cut your teeth. And uh, I love social media and, and TikTok and those things are great, but there's nothing like performing live. And since, you know, you had a stand up comedian, one of the things you're talking about is new material yep. mm -hmm. and how it bombs. Yep. Yeah. Shout out to Marlon. You got to go out there and bomb. Or one of the things I really noticed from touring across the country is you have to have that live aspect of your show, which is call and response or drawing on the crowd's energy. I noticed that most artists in Toronto didn't do that because we were known as the screw face capital. Mm -hmm. So artists here didn't have that as much in their sets. And as a result, they were just kind of rapping to themselves. Whereas when you go across the country, people were like, when you throw your hands in the air, they throw their hands in the air. Yeah. I, I noticed though, we did, me and Slack had went across most of the country. Right. Had everybody crazy. We came here, we were opening for foreign exchange at Revival, okay. Fonte's group from Lil Brother. Okay. Place is packed, Canadian Music Week. All right. And with Art of Fresh, We'd, um, we're like a high energy group, right? Okay. So we do all our stuff that we did on the road. Yo, We'd be jumping fresh. up and down. <laughs> Fire, man. Like, yeah. But, but the crowd didn't respond. Every, most people are just standing there chill. And is that because of Toronto? That's because of Toronto. Screw but face it's cap, not, yo. Don't but forget But what I know it. is it's not that they didn't appreciate the show. Toronto just doesn't have that same energy. Mm -hmm. And I've heard this to this day with big acts. But just because you're not getting that energy from the crowd, that doesn't mean change your show. Right. That doesn't mean like bring our energy down. We still jumping up, doing our thing. And so I think that's a really important part about performing. I mean, you know, I don't, my only pushback to that is tell those people at a Raptors game that they don't stand up. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. And cheer and go sure. crazy. Maybe not for hip hop at that time. Maybe not today for certain people, but. Why is that? Because I, I never grew up in the screw face capital era right, right. like you know is it just a, a certain thing about i have a theory what, yeah. what, tell i me. have a theory uh i think back then there was a lot of other people doing the same thing that you were doing right there's a lot of affiliation you mm -hmm. know what i mean like i'm with this crew i'm with that crew i'm with this 
I'm, I'm from this ends, I'm from that ends and stuff like that. So it would be wrong to cheer for a random person who wasn't in your crew or might be from the opposite side of the city or whatever like that, you know, especially when your cousin is a rapper or anything like that. yo. So for me, when I was make, doing a lot of shows and stuff like I, I wasn't a blood or a crip. I wasn't from, mm. you know what I mean? Like I was I was raised in Rexdale, but then I moved to Woodbridge. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So like all my brethren were from Rexdale and Finch. Yeah. You know, so they would consider me a Finch man and stuff like that. But I was still more of an anomaly than anything. Right. You know what I mean? So if I came in and I'd be, I, I know I did a good job. You know what I'm saying? Like, trust me, yo, like foundation had my back. Our tunes were mixed. Everything was mm. dope, you know, like, but you come off of the stage and <laughs> is that how the nickname <laughs> screwface I mean? came like people were screwing each other over so much in terms of like stabbing each other no back? screwface is just means like yo like you're not smiling with nobody ah. you know what i'm saying like you're not laughing up and key 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 and it's a screw yeah. face thing ah, i'm not screwing okay. people over type of shit <laughs> it's just like you know like true we hard as fuck true but, okay. um and it takes a lot to win a crowd got it yeah. but for me that was also like kind of a a good thing i kind of use that you know like how? to say like listen i come from the screw face capital so if i can actually get you to put your hand in the air you or do something, something or mm. let me know that i actually did a good job mm. i know i'm doing a good job because they sure. ain't giving out claps for free <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? so do i kind of use that even if it was one two three four five mm. at the end of the show i would still use it was that same for you Dio? Yeah, yeah i mean after a while you just have fun with it mm. and like you joke around and i make jokes on stage about it and um because that's kind of how i feel when i go to some high schools you win them over like at the beginning people are sitting back like mm, but then you say a few jokes and then they live up. up yeah, yeah. And, and then you just realize people take things in in their own way because i could go to another school later that day and they go wild so it's you realize after you've done so many shows hey it's not me right it's you right if you if you guys choose not to have this energy right that's on y'all but, but not everything's for everybody you know yeah. what i mean like yo sure. like and what do they say art is subjective yeah, right 100%. once you take the artist objective role yeah. it's like it yo you might not like it i've done theater when i did my little theater stunt for a bit and i would mm. do two shows in a night and one show would be crazy and we do the exact same show and then it wouldn't be as yeah you know what i mean you wouldn't get that that's percent. And that's what yeah. happens when you perform. So mm -hmm. art is definitely subjective, but if you know you're doing a good job and you're doing your thing out there, you, Got know, it. you take and, what you can get. And you were part of that Art of Fresh group yeah. for a while, right? For sure. Yeah. And uh, how long was that going about? Um, like five years. Five years? Yeah, it was, it was a great time. Because, I mean, I've always worked with Slacker. Slacker's from Sarnia as well. All right. Shout out so, to Slacker. Uh, yeah, shout out to Slacker. And I, I remember Slacker. one of the first times meeting him. He's like Fire. five or six years younger than me. I think like six years. Fire. So you got to think like I'm like 22. He's 16. Oh, wow. And uh, first time I met him, he was like, you want to battle? <laughs> 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 I was at my old high school one day. I was working at Big Brothers in the summer. And and yeah, th those were his first things, first words to me. But then he gave me his, his demo cassette. Mm. And I remember uh, I went on a jog. I was listening to the cassette and I was like, this is pretty good. Like, he's a kid who had potential, but there was something in there that's like. Was he doing really his own production too? He was doing his own production. Wow. Which was so crazy. He gave you the mixtape. Because he was, he was really 15. I was 21. So, um, wow. and then like he'd get to be 17, 18. He'd right. come to Toronto, stay with me. Right. I was friends with his parents, you know, right. like they trusted me, you know what I mean? Right. I don't know why, because we, we were a little <laughs> wild back in the day. But uh, yeah, you, we performed together, and then um, we started making different music when we were together. Mm. And there was something about it being different. So one of our first songs is called Get Free, and it's a house the hop. It's house hip-hop, but it sounded different than anything. And that's why I compare us to a lot, like Outkast. Okay. And he's like the Andre 3000, but the producer as well, because we took pride in being different and looking different. And to me, that's what helped us stand out in Toronto, too, that there weren't too many people doing that style of music. Now you did it well. You know, it's not the Thank fact you. that you switched genres. It, it sounded right. It didn't yeah. sound off in a way you know yeah, what i mean like, like, this, like we it were reminded me different. of like what kei is doing now you yeah. know what i mean like they were doing it back then yo Got so it. like 
it was to me it was like almost ahead of, ahead of it yeah yeah, yeah. Mm, okay yeah, and so uh, you guys did it for about five years and yeah. traveled together did shows released music and then did it did you guys just outgrew the group no i think it really what it was is slack had a lot of different things going on okay. <laughs> which okay. which is all good like i mean we're we're tight friends we, we still make music as much as we can but um but that andre 3000 thing with him made him want to do different stuff like mm. he started doing like rock Oh, you know, okay. with his soul, um, with his group, Slackadelics. And he really took it off in different lanes and collaborated with other artists. And then do you think that's I a good thing, thing or, or a bad thing for an artist to do that? Do you think I think it's, it's great. Yeah. I, I mean, like, Slacka just blows my mind in the sense that he's one of those people who can just pick up a musical instrument and just play it. Hmm. Like, he can play the keys. He can get there and do the drums. He can do a bass guitar. can play guitar at not just a passable level but like an expert level and i guess what when it really sunk into me is when we were in england one time and we were in london and we just did a show but we got invited back well he got invited to uh dj jazzy jeff's hotel room oh okay and i met jazzy jeff in sarnia <laughs> hey. he was djing for my birthday it wasn't my because it was my birthday he just happened to be DJ in a town, and he was he was and, having uh, an after party or like his. He hotel was just or? doing a night part in uh, Sarnia, but when I okay. I saw him in Sarnia, we went out for dinner. Okay, and dude was quiet. Wow, never really spoke a word. Mad skills was talking a little bit more. Right, but now we're in London. Me and Slack go to his uh, hotel. This dude just kept talking for about two and a half hours. Because it was Slacker? Or <laughs> it because it was Slacker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just being on some like, yo, you got the gift. <laughs> yeah. Like when you got the gift, you got to use it. You know what I mean? Like, have you ever thought about doing this? Maybe you should try this or like this. And I, I just sat back. I didn't say a word that whole time. That's love, man. <laughs> you, know you know what I mean? To get that from Jazzy too. Like, yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me because he's a music yeah. guy. Like he's just a a legend in the game somebody incredible who, but you know you got those guys who love this and people who just kind of do it yeah you know you can tell artists athletics it happens all the time there's people who really love it and they would yeah. do it and they it's in their blood to do every day and then you have guys who are like yo this is good this is a good deal for me mm -hmm. so i'm yeah. gonna stick this out but if i don't really hear no there with it you know what uh, i mean like yeah so to musician. get that yeah you're right true exactly musician. so to get that from Been through it all jazzy yeah. slacker and to be honest man like he's i think he's one of the top producers to ever come out of this country Dope. man like yeah. you know he's very versatile like he's got all types of swags like you know it's one of the biggest regrets on my career is that we don't have enough records together yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know sure. what i mean like i i'm always hitting time to change like, it yeah yeah like slacker bro send me a pack bro yeah no like, right so but yeah dope. He's a yeah, he's yeah, a busy yeah, guy, and, yeah, and that's yeah. the thing. Big him you know, up to you, the fullest. You gotta let people fly. He's you got know a new I mean? artist 100%. too. He's got a new artist that he's working yeah. with. Yeah, 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 yeah. See what he's doing. So yeah, he's he's doing it, and uh, to me, like the great thing with music is always being close with someone, even if you ain't doing yeah. the music together. But that's love, right and, now, yeah, you know and what I mean? Isn't like, that the game though? Like yeah. nothing. Don't expect anything to last forever. 100%. You know what I mean? Like sometimes the magic is in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, and you capture that moment, whether it be. Yeah five years or one year you know mm. what i mean or six months or just one whatever it is you capture that moment mm -hmm. and if you can bring it back again that's probably why there'll never be another watch the throne album because right. that was that True. moment i was just thinking about them too. yeah, yeah. They, they can make if they really want to they could continue that you know yeah. but that was that moment yeah. so yeah and that's music can't force it either no, right I think we are Oh shit! Maybe I was wrong. That'd be <laughs> incredible. <laughs> I don't know shit. I mean, <laughs> Hove hinted on it on jail on that song jail, but I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll see how that whether that happens or not. Yeah. But to, so uh, after after that, you kind of went into your solo career, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I went into my solo career, and uh, I really just tapped into touring internationally and and loving that and seeing what possibilities were out there. Because can you tell us some of the places that you sure. travel to? And yeah, I guess you? I'll I'll say, because we're going to Cannes mm -hmm. pretty soon, mm -hmm. France, one of the best decisions I ever made was going to Meet Them, which is the world's biggest music conference. It ran for 50 years. Um, they're bringing it back in January. But which, I remember, By the way, I've never heard of before okay. you told me about it years ago. And then I went into this. I'm like, because we're I, I feel like our focus is so much into North America, into yeah. the States. We're, we're sure. always on this mindset that like, LA is the only place on earth for the music industry. And then when I first met you, mm -hmm. you started talking about all these different places around the world. Yeah. And then you started sharing about Midem being the largest 
music conference in yeah. the world and so you went there a long time ago right like you you yeah. were one of the first canadians that kind of went there and started branching out right for sure january 2005 was my first time going wow and i went with the thought i was going to sign some deals because <laughs> especially back then like you could sign deals on the spot mm. but like i also went as one of the first artists ever to go by myself because it wasn't a place you go as an artist you're supposed to be a business person. Mm. And since this guy was in Toronto this week, Chuck D was speaking at the conference. And I remember going to see him and I met him that summer in Toronto. So it's one of those things like when you go up to him, he's like, yeah, yeah. I don't think he really remembered me, but he's good at nice to see you, not nice to meet you. But I remember when he was talking there to this small room, he was just saying the future of music business is going to be about artists taking control of their futures and their destiny by being entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. forming their own teams, not relying on labels to sign them, but that's how you can get out and see the world. Mm -hmm. Now I came back disappointed because I didn't sign a deal. Uh. But I went to go see my man, Ivan Barry, who is, you hold know, on, hold on, hold founder of, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, don't <laughs> just do a flex like that. And yeah. just, uh, you said, yeah, what, your bridging, Ivan Barry? I love Ivan Barry because I remember that was really an opening gateway to Canadian hip hop. Okay. The he, Rap Essentials yeah. mixtapes yep. were like a goal as an artist to be on that kind of annual compilation mm -hmm. of singles that he put together that He's whether Danny O or Cardi <laughs> or Chocler was on there. And I remember just thinking like that was a Canadian dream back then is to get signed to Beat Factory. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. I think Ghetto Concept was on there too. So when I met with him, he said he'd been to me down like the last 20 years. He said... I'd never miss it. I was like, well, I went once. And he said, it's not about all the meetings you have. It's about catching up with old friends. Mm. And he said, some days, like, I could be on a beach in the Caribbean. And I open up my phone and I go through and I just give someone a call. That's how the hype call came from. Because <laughs> he's just thinking, of, oh, I haven't talked to this person. Let me stay in touch with them. And so I went out to meet them that year in 2007. And I met people like Henka Maduro. So she runs New School Rules in mm -hmm. Rotterdam. So that would be my lead into performing in Netherlands. I met Shane Shapiro and he was in London, England. And that would be my lead into playing London. And then New School Rules and this London conference were back to back. So we were able to go to New School Rules and to London. And that's how I really connected with SEMA the Canadian Independent Music Association. So that's I how hope I got them right now, to sponsor I hope New School Rules. Attention. And Music Connect. So that's how we were bringing Rich Kid and Famous and Jay Diggs <laughs> yeah. out to these places. And then I met Fat Philly, who hey, runs shout out Fresh Philly. Island Fest in Croatia. So that's how I started going out to Croatia. Big up to Fat and Philly, And that's how man. I met Jasper, who runs um, Music Matters. So that's how I went out to Hong Kong and later Singapore. So Yo, it was really to instrumental to know these contacts around the world and then if I had something else in another territory, I could make it work. So two of my best friends moved out to Taiwan to teach English as a second language 20 years ago, <laughs> almost. They started to know some clubs there. This one promoter said, you can perform at my club. He's from Ohio, but so I can get you five other shows. So now I could go out to Taiwan and to Japan and get a tour grant and I could also go to Hong Kong, perform at the music festival. So it just took off from me. Then. Hold on, let's sure. bring it back a little. Yeah, a lot so of you, gems that were that, just that, dropped that there. That was a lot, bro. You know, in a good way. Yeah. Uh, this all started from me, them. So yeah. It, that was the first one that you went to, that and was then the, it was kind of. It was the second one. Okay, it was the second one. Which it just but that had to put a spark into you is what you're saying, and then it, yeah. it kind of. Connected a lot of things started dots. to connect. A lot of dots started to connect. Or you yeah. made you started making dots connect that would make you want to I changed my I changed my perspective. Oh okay. is the biggest thing. Okay. Is that first year I went, everybody said, have meetings, meetings, meetings. So I'd cold email people, can I have a meeting? And none of those meetings turned out to be anything. Right. Then I realized maybe I should go out and socialize. <laughs> so I I didn't have very many meetings, but I just go out and meet people mm -hmm. at different things. And I started to really realize the value is in the relationships. Mm. And instead of just going with that perspective of I need to get a deal or I need money or a licensing deal, I just went into it with, 
how do I connect with people? And from those connections and those relationships, I realized they're going to be bigger than just one show. So I've been over to New School Rules like six, seven times mm -hmm. and met so many people from there. But it really started with having that relationship at first and not so much of like, what can you do for me? It's what do you do? And maybe I can get Canada to like buy into this. Right. Mm -hmm. Seema spent a lot of money to put on Canadian artists there, so she saw that it was a benefit working with me because I was helping facilitate things to make her event even bigger. So yeah, can I can I yeah, just jump in? Uh, so this is the Dreams I Have Deadlines podcast, right? So I'm yeah. thinking about someone who's never been on an international conference before, mm -hmm. who's hearing you speak right now is like, yo, maybe I need to go sign up for New School Rules or go to Medam or whatever, you know, get out of Canada and, or wherever I'm at in the world and start traveling and making some moves. Um, what do you have a recommendation for them? Do you think that because off of my experience, like I was I've been to Medam and mm -hmm. Medam just like you was eye opening for yeah. me. You know what I'm saying? Like as coming as a Canadian hip hop artist who's actually been signed mm -hmm. to Universal and has done tours, but yeah. to be across the pond like that and like see that there's so much different businesses and opportunities mm -hmm. out there in this one spot, like it kind of changed my perspective as well. Definitely. So what would you tell somebody that's kind of starting out? I'd say uh pick a place that you want to go. So if you I remember a lot of artists would say, like, my music would do great in Europe. Right. It's a blanket statement. You don't really know. Like, a lot of people do great in Europe. Like, <laughs> Europe's a huge place. Yeah. Oh, I could see my music working in, in England, right. for instance. But you've never been there. You so don't know anything you know? about it. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's, it's like that old dream of, I got to make it in New York. So, mm. I would say, if you feel like your music is going to make it in England or whatnot, try to find an event there. Or if you feel like your music's going to make it in the States or in Atlanta, go to A3C, the music festival there. So mm -hmm. I would research a music conference. I like that. Because then there's something going on. Re but not only that, but research a conference that makes sense to your style of yeah, music. Yeah, to make sense to you. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, then you're going to know that you're going to at least see people. Because it's great to say you want to go to Atlanta, but you can go down to Atlanta and not know anyone. And it's going to be hard for you to just meet people. Yeah. yeah. But if you go to a conference, I'd say feel, comfor feel comfortable going by yourself. Because going by yourself forces you to get out of your shell. Wow. Even if you're an introvert. Because naturally, I'm an introvert. Yeah. But going to these places, it's like I had to talk to people because I'm by myself. And I also learned it's really important to represent where you're from. Or what you do. I, I was pointing to my hat. Usually I'm wearing a Blue Jays one. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm wearing Black Canadian. Yeah, this absolutely. is my own brand and it's Canada. That's what's up. Because when you wear something that shows you're Canadian, that brings up conversation. That is, I don't know if people know that if you've never traveled before. It is very cool to be a Canadian outside yeah. of North America. Yo, from my experience, people would be like, oh, you're not American? Cool, bro. <laughs> I'm yeah, with cool, you, bro. man. And, yeah. and it, it could be a Raptors hat. Maybe you bump into a sports fan. Yeah. Next thing you're doing, you're talking sports. Yeah. And if you're at a conference, it's like uh, you're talking sports this long time. But then at the end of it, what do you do? Oh, mm. I'm here for the music conference. You know, I'm just getting a coffee right now at this mm. coffee shop. But like, is that yeah, why I you love licensing. sports so much? Yeah, yeah. Because you can make it work for you? you? Yeah. You, and I also realize when you're talking to business people, you don't have to talk about business. Business. Yeah. You know, Can you, you say that one more time, <laughs> yo? Like, I love yeah, you, that. You don't, I almost talk about everything else. Except business. Except business. That's smart. Like, Very. You know, um, when I talked to the late David Heyman, music supervisor. Yeah. Shout R. out R. to David. He was, he was telling did me. Did he just get an award? He, uh, he did. They, they, they named an award. Yeah, they they named, that's what award. I mean. Huey. And his protege, Cody. Partridge, I think he won like three or four awards. Yeah, let's four go. They called him the big winner. Yeah. Let's I, was go. Up, I was about to say, it, it was called the Cody Partridge Awards this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah know, exactly. I love it. But David Shout Heyman, such an influential uh, guy my, that my career, touched lot, all of us, all, all, all of the people of in this room, you know, man? Yeah. And what I was going to say about him is, I remember reaching out to him. I'd never met the guy, but Fat Al had put me in touch with him, and we were going to be at East Coast Music Awards in um, Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. And when he hit me back, he was like, Man, I heard so much about you, whether from Fat Al or last month I was at South by Southwest and I met this guy who knows you. Flex. 
He went, they were just in a corner store, just getting gum or, or a bottle of water. And he met Tay, who's from, he lives in Florida. He's from Chicago. And they just had a conversation about being fathers. And when he said he's from Toronto, Tay said, I wonder if you know my, my man D.O. And they chopped it up there. And so there was nothing in there about the music business. It was just, they were just talking in there. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. they talked about their daughters. And then Toronto came up and my name came up. But that's, to me, that's you the, the Gio, You got the Mario about. coin sound? Can we yeah. add that in there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> so what I see here in these, right there, uh, in these stories is that you know, you find opportunities in a very different way because a lot of us go travel or try to, you know, let's say we're going to a place across the world and we're mm. like, we have the goal of signing a deal. We need sure. to book a world tour. We need to do X, Y, and Z. And you flipped it and you're like, no, we need to create relationships yeah. because those relationships are going to garnish some long-term benefits by not talking about business right away. Let's talk mm. about our life. Let's connect on a human level. And I, I was, I've was i been doing sales for a long time. Mm. And the one thing I've learned about sales is people buy from people. Yeah. And my most successful sales that I've ever gotten in my career is just the fact of you connecting with a human being that and being bizarre. like, hey, I'm a human, I'm a, you're a human, we like each other. Most of the time, you're buying the product and not really caring what the product does, but because of the relationship, you want to just grow it. Yeah. And on top of that, it, what I see here also is that you're all, you always have a good reputation. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're meeting people with kindness. Mm -hmm. And it seems like no matter what, nobody can say bad things about Dio. And it's like, yo, my man Dio, my man Dio, this is my, my guy Dio. No matter what, nobody says bad things about Dio. To be honest and, with you, and man, that creates I feel longevity. Like Dio's overlooked more than he should mm -hmm. be, yo. You know, I don't know if you how you feel about it, but like, yo, I feel like, you know, from all the work that you've done, bro, you're at three almost three thousand shows, performances. You've been toured all over the world. You've had international successes. Mm -hmm. You you put out books. You you know you have a, a legacy of and a discography of. Mm -hmm. You have a, a whole map of the things you've done, yo. You know, so uh, I don't think your name underrated. is talked about enough. You know, as somebody who really reps for this country, 100%. you know, like and has been doing it for a very opening long opening doors and, for a lot of people uh, like yeah, us. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. I, I've, after all these years, do you do you look back and see what you've accomplished and be like, wow, look at what I've done? Or are you always just looking forward? I you always look at what you're doing because one of my albums is called Seeds and Dominoes about how you got to plant seeds and then knock over the dominoes. Because hey. it's like, I'd like to think I have a good reputation because I help people. Mm -hmm. So I never looked at the music business as competition. I never looked at Rochester and thought like, He's my competition. I gotta outdo him. Yeah. I I looked at it as like face capital. Yeah, yeah, but I was like, the more success you have, the more success I can have, or the more success you know Drake's obviously taking into the stratosphere. Yeah, yeah. Right. But we both came up with Drake, yep. and that opened up doors in the long run. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, but I just looked at it as the more successful we all are, or when I'm going take that time we went to Amsterdam. You know, me, you, and famous. Me, you, Gio. and Geo. <laughs> yeah, and it's just Gio, the strength Gio of that still unit talks about together. That to this was, day, man. or like an, another time really is my first time bringing people to Amsterdam. Right. I knew these dope producers, and they pulled up at the hotel. They brought the monitor up into the hotel room, and it's me, Sean Booth, Rich Kid, and Famous, and they're playing some of their own music for these guys, and. And these guys are like, man, you brought like a dream team. Like you brought an army. I was going to say. And like, so yeah. I just felt my strength is just increased by the dope people that I'm surrounded with. 100%. And so it means a lot that I can help out other people. Right. And so as far as what you're saying, I think as an artist, we all feel like we're overlooked. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I learned from my uncle. I was just with him last month out in Nova Scotia. And my uncle is one if not the most successful black business people in this country. Mm. Runs a lot of businesses. Hugely successful. Sometimes I give him a hype call. He, he's out in the yacht <laughs> out in Florida. Or, Is that or where you soak things. up a lot of game from? I, I soak up a lot of game from the little things he says. Okay. But he purposely, Larry Gibson. All right. And my grandfather's name is Larry Gibson. So hey, he's hey, named hey, after hey, my, my grandfather. That's what's up. But he, you don't see his name in the papers a lot. 
The Globe and Mail did a big article on him a couple years ago. He's won a Harry Jerome Award for Black Businessman of the Year. Yeah. But he said, don't worry about your name being in the papers. Just work on your business. Mm. And what I took from that is, sure, it'd be nice if people talked about me all the time, but I'm more concerned about my business and having a business that is sustainable. Like, I just booked 20 shows in Vancouver in January next year for Black Canadian 365. Let's go. And every day almost, I perform in front of kids, and at the end of the show, it's like, you're, you're my favorite rapper ever. Mm -hmm. And so... That's, that's what I hey, care about. That's smart. Me and Max, <laughs> me and Max went on the Believe uh, Bow Party yesterday, and uh, I didn't know this, but Sage Harris comes up to us and he's like, "Bro, nice to meet you. Finally, you know what I mean? I'm an artist. I'm doing my thing." And you came to my high school. Yeah. You know dope. what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you came to my... I remember when you That's came. So big up, crazy. big you up, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? For like, it's... I remember that shit, yo. You know? So I'm a sure. fan. And if you haven't checked out his stuff, he's... Great artist. Knows. Like, you know what I mean? He's dope. really dope right now. So, um... That's, that's such a... That, and he's not the only one. You know? Man. Like, that happens to me a lot. A lot? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, and for so sure. I can only imagine for you having played like so many shows and being uh just touring a lot of schools yes yeah talk it's to us schools. about the Crazy. schools too yeah. because that's a market i find that you know not a lot of people tap into because mm. you know a lot of people might have a different perception at performing schools yeah. but what you just said there like sage harris remembered you from performing at a school and yeah. now look at him exactly and be like wow let me connect with this guy and you guys are you know growing growing together exactly. in the yeah. industry yeah. and you have performed well you were talking about 3,000 shows, which is insane, by the way. But <laughs> like how you just said, 3,000. 3,000 shows. <laughs> He's just trying to downplay it, but it's impossible to say shows. that number. I like, what, 3, are, we, what are we going to say to that? Like, like how, how can you so. even compare? But tell me about, like, how did you enter the school market and, and why did you enter it? It seemed like it's a great opportunity and a great market because kids grow up with, your, with yeah. your name. Well, I started in 2001. My mother, I said about my dad, mm. he's a minister. My mom was a teacher. Okay. She became a principal. And the thing about a lot of teachers, their friends are teachers. Right. So uh, shout out to the society. Flashers. All we ask is trust. Oh, yes, it's trust. <laughs> so I remember um, two of my parents' best friends. They live in Stratford, Ontario. And they asked me to speak at their school in the morning and then the husband's school in the afternoon. And uh, I was in a library, wasn't in a gym. I remember like being nervous. Like, how am I going to do this for an hour? And it went well. And then uh, my man Kunle, who directed my first music video, his mother was a teacher at Timothy Eaton School, mm. which is in Scarborough, and it's a technical institute. So, you know, you say both those things, you think that's a rough crowd, mm -hmm. but they were a great crowd. So I realized I could do this for kids, I could do it for high school students. Then I just printed a brochure, I went individually to schools, I pitched it, because I realized I could get paid. But after doing that, I was like, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to be known as a motivational speaker? So I went to New York. And I didn't have any connections in New York, but me and my man Kunle went down there. And he had one connection to MTV. And he called that guy on a Thursday afternoon. And he said, why don't you guys come by Friday, the next day? And this was 2003 when I did the Guinness World Record. And when I talked to much music, it was always like, give us a call in three weeks. I'm sorry, what's the Guinness World uh, I Record? I said the world person? record for the world's longest freestyle rap. Ooh. Eight hours and 45 minutes. What? Yeah. So uh, in New York, we that, go... Well, that's how we started the show. This yeah, guy's yeah. a Guinness yeah, World, yeah. world Record holder, two bro. Two 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 for those that don't know, is that is, the, is both times for the longest freestyle? No, the other time is for running. Really? Yeah. I signed up for a 10K that's the most 10Ks in the world in one day. It's all done virtually because of COVID. So on September 19th last year, after a night hanging out with Classified and Quake Matthews in Nova Scotia, hey, shout out to I them. got up and did 10K. I'll tell you. No, you driven, did boy. it, man. Stay Get the driven. fuck. Are you serious? Hey, I might I didn't have been know slow, that. but I still did 10K. I, did. <laughs> I just wow. love saying I got a second world record wow. in some running. Uh, wow. I got a medal for it, too. <laughs> wow, wow. Look at man. So uh, well, what, what, what I'm saying about New York is we go to this meeting the next day at MTV right at Times Square. Okay. And we just think we're having a meeting. Mm -hmm. We walk right in. We're on MTV radio. He's videotaping it, recording it. We get done that. He says, you should meet my son. I don't know who his son is. He calls his son. He works at Def Jam. He says, we should go over there right now. 
So now we walk over like five blocks to Def Jam. Ja Rule in the lobby. We go up. We're in a meeting with Def Jam. Ja Rule Rockefeller Records. Jim Jones is there shooting basketball in one of oh those little God. play basketball nets. You know, next thing you know, I'm freestyling in the spot. It's all wow. being filmed. It's all wow. on video, too. What year was this? This is 2003. Nice. Wow. So... We ja Rule there. at his peak. Yeah, Ja Rule at the peak, <laughs> at killing his it. fucking peak. So I end up coming back to New York and spending a few, like a month there. And I go back to Def Jam a couple of times. And I remember the advice one of the A&Rs said is when I talked about how I'm doing schools, he's like, wow, you can do that out there? You do that for free though, right? I was like, no, I get paid. You getting paid? He said, well, you could come to New York, but like there's thousands of rappers. Wow everybody on every corner and Sorry, who trying said this? to get this one of the a&r's oh, okay and so um he said yeah. <laughs> the key thing you want to think about is building your fan base mm. think about if you're doing 100 schools times 500 500 kids a school and you're getting paid man you're building your fan base he told you those that? are your fans yeah so i remember driving back to canada and instead of thinking toronto is like man nothing's happening here it just renewed my sense of purpose and drive and determination. And that January, I started going out. I was living in Brampton. I'd just go out, get my flyers out. I just started booking a lot of shows, making money. And then I just took it from there. And, wow. uh, and what I noticed was teachers, thank you, become vice principals. Vice principals become principals. Right. Vice principals go to other schools. Right. And so it's just that constant referral from people. It's a secret society. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes, just. And uh, just using that to just <laughs> keep things there. going. You know, yeah, and shout yeah. out to you to not having like a narrow tunnel vision of someone being like, no, that teacher might be a principal one day. Right. Yeah. That A&R might be an executive one day. That kid might grow up to be an A&R or whatever that I might work with one day. And it yeah. seems like you're always looking at what's the long term of this? Who, who This person always has potential. Yeah. And if I grow that relationship, it might come back to me. Now, I want to ask you the question now. I think that's a perfect lead up to that question. <laughs> Why do you think dreams don't have deadlines as somebody who's seen that? you know, generations, not generations, but well, maybe, yeah, generations. Yeah, yeah. You know, people have come and gone in this business and, you know, tried and failed. And mm -hmm. do you believe that dreams don't have deadlines? And if you do, then why? I think it's, it's just about growing and evolving. Mm -hmm. So I have deadlines for my goals. Right. Short-term goals, long-term goals, but those goals also change and evolve. Mm -hmm. So it's like, my new album is called Still Driven. Still my driven. first one was called Stay, Stay driven. driven. Yeah, yeah. But it's like my goal in 2001 was to have a music video on Much Music. Mm -hmm. It was to have my CD in stores. Right. Now, if I told you that was my dream right now, to have a music video on Much Music, to have my CD in stores, mm. I'd be a dinosaur. I think a, a body of work, whether it's an album or an EP, should capture where you are, capturing that moment in time. Mm -hmm. And your singles also capture that story as well and yeah. they don't have to be a personal story but capture where you are in life and so that when you look back at your discography or your catalog it's telling you that whole story of, of your career and i think um artists that do that are, are some of my favorites i mean that's why jay-z is always one of my favorite artists because he was conscious of that i find when he was coming out with music right like when he was on the blueprint series and yeah saying where he's at in life yeah you get that album. feeling that whenever he drops something something he's thinking about like where does this fit into the legacy of yeah. my story you know yeah. what i mean 100%. like even if yeah. it is blueprint 2 or 2.1 right. you Very know powerful. what i mean like i this is still going to be a part of my story whether it be mm -hmm. the greatest album i've ever made in my life or just something that's yeah. in between yeah. there it's a you great know answer. unless unless you have like because you think about kendrick lamar right and he just oh, dropped his album yeah. and everything like that and I guess just maybe this is the first time where he's had mixed reviews mm -hmm. for his album. You yeah. know what I mean? Some people love it. Some people think, oh, this ain't, you know, to pimp a blood of fly for yeah. me. You know, yeah. like whatever. You know, but great it's a chapter part of, of his life to show, though. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm a Kendrick fan. So yeah. I think the album's fire. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I think this is one of those things that is a part of his story. Mm -hmm. But the, the point is that maybe he, you know, when you have like, all of these greatly reviewed albums and like you're revered as this goat. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's like, ah, do I want to drop something that I don't 
I'm not sure is going to be living up to whatever I had before. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, so like, 100%. Yeah, so, but you got to be conscious of your story, whatever it is. And it, I don't think it matters. I think if you're a fan, it doesn't yeah. matter. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Whether you drop the best album you make every time you drop some yeah. shit or you're just being consistent mm-hmm. with your story and making the best music you know how to make at that time time i think you know? kendrick's a great example too because he's somebody who's always pushing the boundaries yeah. yeah like he isn't coming out with the same thing much like an outcast like it's like when outcast dropped you wanted it to be different yeah. and i think there's something to be said about the music you listen to at first you don't really get it yeah like when wu-tang came out i wasn't a wu-tang fan i didn't get it but then i started listening to him more and then i was like this is the best thing i ever heard so i think sometimes art has to challenge you that was actually jay-z for me really yeah that was actually Jay-Z oh like me. reasonable doubt reasonable doubt yeah yeah yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah yeah i thought it was good but i i never really uh, yeah. went into it i didn't get it till deep. actually lucius put me onto it the like lucius. i heard it i was like oh <laughs> all right this is dope yeah this guy's very rich and he's making a lot of money and he's putting it in my face yeah still you know yeah what i mean i was i was actually more of a wu-tang fan nice than mm. anything that's you know? true because art is timeless because i find that music that came out 20 years ago I'm listening to it now mm. and actually appreciating more. more. Yeah, because Wu Tang, uh, Jay Z's Reasonable Doubt, yeah. even Outkast's first album, right. like a lot of the, these this music, I I was it was all hype back in the day. Sure. But to me, I'm like I'm not connecting with it. Mm-hmm. But now, 20 years later, I'm finding myself going back and like that tells you how timeless art is and how you can you might not appreciate it today. Mm-hmm. And the, you know what that that kid that saw Dio in that school today. I'd be like, hmm, I'm not really resonating to, to this. Mm. But 10 years later, he's like, man, I, I really understand what Keep he's going, saying Max. right Keep now. Keep going, man. Tell um, I want to talk about just a little bit sure. about your story a little more. Um, one, it seems like to, to all those artists, because there's a lot of independent artists in, in Canada today. Yeah. And you seem to have diversified yourself mm-hmm. to finance your career and your life. Because there's we know a lot of musicians mm-hmm. and independent artists. And there's not a lot out there that can say that they're a full-time musician and fund themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, got to sell that. A hundred percent. dime bags and shit. You seem <laughs> yeah. to have found <laughs> a way to have found different sources of income. Mm-hmm. To, because there's grants. Yeah. Um, there's merch. Yeah. There's shows. And, you know, whether it's international sure. or schools, there's books now. Um, you know, what? what's the, the advice that you can tell artists today that might only focus on record sales? Because that seems like to be such a narrow vision right now for our, for musicians. They think record sales is the only thing. Is. Streams. Streams is the only yeah. thing is, but which we know <laughs> pays peanuts yeah. today. They're not like yeah. physical sales. Yeah. If I can get on rap caviar, I've made it. Right. And yeah. that, that, that is end all be all for me if I'm on the top editorial yeah. playlist. What advice would you give artists it. right now that th- you know that are just focusing too much on record sales? well i think you have to decide what your dreams are and Mm -hmm. what deadlines you want to put in place for that like it really meaning your goals and so if you want to be a full-time job or if you want to make revenue from it you have to learn a business and you can do that from watching youtube clips you can do it from reading books you can do it from attending music conferences but once you do familiarize yourself with the business then you realize that these exact same playlists that you're talking about are controlled by the major labels. Yeah. And that the percentage of independent artists that crack those are incredibly small. Mm -hmm. So, and then you could look at how artists that do have streaming numbers, are they inflating them themselves? Mm -hmm. And should you inflate your numbers yourself? And those are things you have to ask yourself and, and realize what your budget is for your projects and how you going to allocate it instead of just doing everything on the fly because there's so much that you have to put forward into a project whether it's paying producers paying studio time um paying for a youtube or spotify playlist promoter Mm -hmm. to actually do it like in a proper way but help pitch you to get more streams but at the end of the day your revenue from streams are going to be really low very low. whereas if you can license that track to like we've had songs on kim's convenience yep and now that show is even bigger now than it was five years ago because yeah. the success of one of the actors 
Yeah, but, they, I gave them a song for too cheap, man. I should have charged them a lot. I more. know, but <laughs> they, got, they got the next. But the streams, deal. yeah. Simu, Simu's exactly. a huge star right but now, you know, man. Like, it, it, I gave that shit away, man. <laughs> Some of my biggest Kim's songs convenience. are streams from Letter Kenny. I never watched the show. Yeah, but like being on there, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's huge, right? Which is which is dope. Like you, oh, and then your you, my YouTube right. is like came here because of Letter Kenny or stuff like that. Yeah. So. But I would only have learned that from learning different aspects of the music business. Mm -hmm. Or specifically, shout out to what we do with Northern Power Summit because we had David Heyman speak yeah. and somebody put up their hand and said, how do we license our music? And he said, come talk to me. <laughs> so by coming to that conference and talking to him, there's at least 20 artists that mm -hmm. did licensing deals at our conference. Wow, man. And they might not be for a lot of money, but it's some money yeah 100 percent. and to me know? it's it's all about that some money because like it goes back <laughs> to what i said with slacker he performed at my record release party back in the day when he was 16 and not a lot of people came to the show the people that came most of them didn't pay yeah right <laughs> they, oh i'm on vip guest list but at the end of the night when i dropped him off same night Aaliyah died and you got to remember, we were in Sarnia, so we got the Detroit radio feed. So it, was, it got emotional, like on the radio, like everybody cried. When Slacker went in his house, I gave him 100 bucks or 150. Right. I didn't make any money from the show. I probably lost money. Right. But I told him I was going to pay him. So you did. And I always remember, like, Four Corners DJ for me in, in 2002. Big up to Kirk. And not a lot of people came to the show that paid. <laughs> but I paid him when it was two people. <laughs> and... I think by doing that, I built that relationship with people. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what artists have to do is is like it's, just the small things you do, those small gestures or actions prove to be a lot in the in the long run. Really? 90% business, man. How much people have music. you fucked over in your career? <laughs> I don't think I have anybody. Zero. And, um, I don't think so. Zero. Either, man. I, it, Such a strong question. And, <laughs> and, and, and the tough thing is people have messed me. But I know what the answer is. Because <laughs> yeah. it, it's frustrating. Is, it's like I've gotten zero. people grants like for twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 and they've messed up on a grant. Right. So then I didn't get the money. Mm. And that's part of the reason why like I just, I don't really write grants for, anymore. for anybody, you know, or sometimes, but it's like, I always say like for showcase grants. So you get a showcase grant. That means let's say you can perform in Amsterdam at new school rules. Mm -hmm. yes. So you got enough money for your flight and your hotel. I hope yeah. you're listening. Now you, with flights, you're not paying cash. You're putting that on a credit card. Yep. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a hotel. Yep. Now, when you get the grant, you have to show that you spent the money. Mm -hmm. Now a studio time might be different. Hey, I came to my boy's studio. I gave him $200 cash. But if you're flying or getting a hotel, you got a credit card receipt. Some artists are so lazy, they don't send in that credit card receipt. Or they'll say, you never told me. I said, that's not my job. And, <laughs> and I do send you a list of everything you got to do. Yeah, yeah. But if you can't, and that artist will say, can you get me another grant? There's one for my album for 10000 15000 If you can't handle 1500 how no are you going to handle 15000 15, yeah, people um, think that grand shit is like, yo, it's so blessed or whatever. And it, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And, and it, <laughs> yeah, and it can be, it definitely yeah. can be. But like, if you're not willing to do the work or just, you know, do the logistics that's, that comes with it, it's going to be a nightmare for yeah, you. Yeah, it is. You know, even it if is. you do get the grant, yo, so be careful. Because if you get that one for 15, how are you going to deal with with the one for 150000 Yeah, 100%. That's if what you, we're if playing you can't with handle hey. 15. I was waiting for the Mario, but you hey. put it back. Hey. <laughs> hey. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. All right, that's a little too long. Nope. <laughs> hey. There we go. Because, yeah, you, you, I mean, right there, you just dropped, by the way, making, um, getting six figures yeah. within grants that are help fueling your career, your mm -hmm. life. And, and that's because you've been so consistent on yeah. making sure earning, you, you know, figures. yeah, not earning giving. six not figures. Giving. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to end, uh, things off with this question. Yeah. Um, so again, this is the dream zone. Home Alliance stretch. Mm -hmm. Um, your story is incredible, by the way. Thank you. Has there been a point in your journey where you thought, you know, this is the end? My, right. my dream has this deadline that this is not working and I'm at a low point and I'm about to give up. Mm -hmm. And if that has happened, what have you done to change things around? 
right to continue and you know if you can look in that camera and give that advice because someone might be in a slump right now and you know they need a little advice to kind of keep going i think you really got to turn into yourself when you're going through a tough time and you can't just rely on people to give you motivation one thing i do is i read a lot of books those are what inspire me but if one thing isn't working you got to pivot you got to switch up your game and you got to ask yourself how much you want it. And then you just build a plan of attack of how you're going to get there. And you work every day to get towards that goal. To have a big goal, you have to break it down into small things. I write down to myself five things I'm going to do every day. They might seem like small things, but those add up. Because you take five, you multiply it by seven, 35, you multiply it by a month. And all those little actions turn into big things. So of course there's times where I've been frustrated. There's times where I've been turned down for grants or not gotten play for a song or this or that. But I always came back to the reason why I want to do it. And then there's little signs I'd like to think that come along that show you if you are going down the right path. Maybe somebody you meet or it could be somebody saying, yo, I love listening to that one song you had. I was going through a tough time, it boosted me up. Or just connecting with somebody who's like, yo, I'm doing this one thing, maybe you should be part of it. But those things happen when you put yourself in positions to succeed and going to music conferences, going out to shows, supporting other artists that are doing the same thing you're doing it can only add to good things when you stay driven. Because your dreams hey, don't hey, have deadlines. Hey, <laughs> I got big dreams. <laughs> Million dollar schemes. <laughs> bar after bar right I don't there. Think you could have said it better, man. Well, yeah. thank you so much. I, got, I still got it. I yeah, wasn't go actually. Ahead. Yeah, go I, I wanted to ask you a few sure. more things. Um, you have been a defender mm. of Canadian history. Mm. But not mm. just... Canadian history, black Canadian history. Right. You mean you've made that a, a pivotal part of, of what you do, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I believe so, that's what yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah, right. So why? Why? To me, black Canadian history is who I am. I remember moving to Toronto and not understanding this place because I didn't realize that when somebody said, Where are you from? when I went to university, they weren't saying like they weren't asking if I'm from Sardia. <laughs> And when they say, where are your parents from? My mom was white, is from Saskatchewan, but my dad's from Nova Scotia. And then they say, where are your great grandparents from? And I'm a sixth generation black Canadian. Mm. And so it's like- Damn, six? That's as Canadian as you can get. You know, I go as far back as my great, great, great grandfather was a Maxwell and Rudyard Kipling wrote about him. The same guy who wrote about the Jungle Book. That's wow. crazy. Yeah, they said about my great grandfather, he's a light skinned brother. He, he could talk. Mm. And he could drink. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Two things. And, um, you know, my great uncle is Lincoln Alexander, the first black lieutenant governor of Canada. Jeez, so oh he, wow. he's a half Gibson. Wow. My great grandfather is the one who brought over his dad over to this country. And then, um, you know, growing up or having family in Nova Scotia, it's like I'd spend a lot of my summers in New Glasgow. And that's where Viola Desmond happened. And my aunt wrote the newspaper article on that. And. My uncle is the first black person in Canada to get the Order of Canada. So when I was asked to come into schools and talk about black history, all I heard was Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. Right. And this is in Toronto schools as well as country. But I was just like, there's more to it. So I knew the story of Viola Desmond years ago. A family friend is the lieutenant governor who pardoned her. And I wanted those stories to be amplified. You know, um, the first black person on on a stamp in Canada is Josiah Henson. And that's where the term Uncle Tom comes from. There's Uncle Tom's cabin in Canada. Now you hear the that's word- That's where it comes from, Canada? From Canada. From one of the greatest heroes that there is, Uncle Tom. Now this is a man who was in Kentucky. I think we talked about this. Came yeah. 800 kilometers to get to Canada, came with his wife and four kids. Two of them were young. I take my kids out to the Vaughn Mills when they were young. After 15 minutes, daddy, hold me. But uh, 800 <laughs> kilometers to get here, Lazy he settles in, <laughs> in Dresden, Ontario, and um, by Chatham, by London, Ontario. He goes back on the Underground Railroad 13 times to bring more people here. Wow. Not only that, he gave them land to farm 
some of my friends are still there to this day that are descendants and they're farmers. Like my boy Chris Prince is like, we got to go pick some cotton this summer, Dio. <laughs> but they're making money off it now. So these are stories that aren't necessarily told. Now, I'll tell you, the switch of it is Uncle Tom's Cabin is, they named a book after it by Harriet Beecher Stowe. And when it came out, it sold more than the Bible. So you got to think slavery is still going on. And this book is selling a lot. It's about slavery. So when they made a play of it, they changed the character of the hero, Josiah Henson, Uncle Tom, and they made him a subservient black man. So that's why you have the term Uncle Tom. Wow. When Uncle Tom was should in fact be a the hero. hero. Wow. And that's why you got to learn history because then you realize you know. how things have changed and how things can be misinterpreted. Interpreted, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. right. <laughs> Viola Desmond didn't just sit in the movie theater. Right. Why was she there in the movie theater? Right. How'd she get there? Because she was a black businesswoman. And at that time, you didn't see a lot of black businesswomen, especially mm -hmm. hairstylists. Mm -hmm. She wasn't allowed to learn how to do hairstyling in Nova Scotia mm -hmm. because she was black. So she went to school in New York under Madam C.J. Walker, the first black female millionaire. Couldn't That's right. Learn here, so she went down there. Those are bars from One Woman Could Change the World, one of my latest singles. Hey. So she went and did that, started a beauty school to help more women, black women, be able to become entrepreneurs. She had her own line of beauty products. Is that so the girl who Octo Brown. Octavia Davis did that movie about? Which that's the movie he's talking about, right? Yo, fire! Yeah, 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 yeah. For uh, Madam C.J. Walker, but yes, Viola Desmond learned from her. Came back to Nova Scotia. Yeah, started a business. Started a beauty line products. She was driving to Cape Breton, five hour drive. Car breaks down. She was going there to sell her beauty products. Mm. She didn't have a man with her. She was doing this all by herself. So I mm. say to kids. Yeah, the first part of the story is she sat down in the movie theater. But the second part is she's a black entrepreneur, yes. a female black entrepreneur. And all these black women helped her. Man Francis gave her the pardon. Her sister posthumously made sure her story was known. Carrie Best, the first black publisher in Nova Scotia, wrote about the story. So you feel like you're carrying that her. torch right now. I'm carrying that torch. Hell yeah. And I carry it because, you know, when George Floyd happened... We're just talking about death. We're talking, you know, a lot of people trying to reconcile their feelings about black people. Yeah. And in Canada, you had that feeling, but it's like, no, let's, let's give them the real knowledge. <laughs> let's talk about what really happened. And I love talking about hockey because a black Canadian created the slap shot mm. and PK Subban's brother is still getting told he's a monkey and a gorilla <sighs> to this day. And black people had the Colored Hockey League in Nova Scotia 22 years before yep. the NHL started. Yep. My family was part of that, too. <laughs> you have Africville. You have Did you race play hockey? riots. I never played hockey. You, you but uh, you're I'd a love big boy, to. man. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. Then, and then finally, you know, I love when I put on the screen that I got three things in common with this guy. I mean, we're both entertainers. We both have black fathers from Nova Scotia. Mm. And both of our first names are Dwayne. Hey. But Dwayne The Rock Johnson, man, his dad is from Amherst, Nova Scotia. Oh, really? You know what his name is? No. Nah. His dad's name is Wade Bowles. That's his name? That's his name. His last, Dwayne's last name is in Johnson. Oh, shit. So Wade Bowles chose the name Rock because of Rocky Marciano, mm, the yeah. Italian heavyweight. That's yeah. right. And he chose the name Johnson because of Jack Johnson, the first black United States, United States heavyweight champion. Yes. Wow. So that's how the name Rock Johnson, Johnson. comes. Wow. So, well, you heard it from Professor D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, you get me started talking about wow. black history. Well, I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I got you know, stories You've today. been up your of this for forever, bro. So I, I rate it so much. <laughs> hey. But I, and, and that's, you know, that's why you say uh, we were talking. I don't know if it was on camera about, but like getting tired of performing songs or, yeah. or, or telling these stories. I never get tired of telling the stories because. I feel that these stories haven't been told enough. And I just find it fascinating when you hear these things. Like, last one I'll say, Willie O'Ree, first black hockey player in the NHL. Played for Boston. Played for Boston. Yeah. You know why it's crazy that he made it to the NHL? Why? Because no. he was blind. What? Hockey puck hit him in the right eye. He lost 98% of his vision in his right eye before he made it to the NHL. Back in the day, they didn't wear helmets. They didn't wear visors. Wow. He didn't tell anybody, 
Because if he told them that he only has one good eye, he's not going to get playing. Yeah, taken. you're not playing. And you're black? Stop it. So, get out of here. So, but when you tell that to a seven-year-old kid from, you know, Prince George, B.C., that loves hockey, barely seen any black people, but they hear that story, they're like, wow. Like, yeah. that's just a cool story. Right. And it's this black guy. Like, wow. Yeah. And I just love that that, because I do a lot of work in remote areas where people haven't seen very many black people, maybe almost none. But that kid from Prince George one day might come to Toronto. And when he comes to Toronto, you don't want them just saying some ignorant stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, you see that happen all the time. And they were just ignorant. They weren't racist. You're telling that story, man. <laughs> and we love it, bro. Thank you yeah. so much, man, for coming on. And, Thank you. You know what I mean? This is, uh, this is very cool. I think I learned a lot. I think everybody who... <laughs> You know, sees this, yo. Like, uh, this is Dreams Don't Have Deadlines podcast, yeah. man. You're going to see this right now, and I don't know 100%. how it can't put a battery in your back, yo. So, thank you for coming. Yes. My name is Juice Rochester, Rochester Juice. My name is Marwan Manamne, and do not forget to check out Dio's uh, book, On This Grind. On This Grind. Where, where can they buy it? Um, I am DioGibson.com. See, one of the things I put in there is about branding, brand one on one. Everything for me is I am D.O. Gibson. TikTok, I am D.O. Gibson. Instagram, I am D.O. Gibson. Boom. I am D.O. Gibson.com. Everywhere. Hey, let them oh, know, yeah. man. I like it. Check it out on this grind available everywhere. Yeah. I remember, I remember, yo. And stay what driven. Do I say? What do I say? Stay Auto driven. <laughs> and a dream is what you make it, but you'll never make it without a dream. You feel me? percent Thank you so much, D.O. Your inspiration. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Work hard and I handle my business. Look up in the sky, whole squad, let's get it. No limit, no. no, no.